Hello, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. Today, we're delighted to have as our special guest the National Vice President of the National Farmers Organization, Mr. Earhart Fingston. I must call him by the name most people call him by, his associates and friends around the country, and that's Fink. I guess that's as good a way to approach it as any, right? That's the one I like. Best Fink, of all. Uh, Fink doesn't like his first name, and he doesn't like to be called Mr. Fingston, and so uh, everybody settles for Fink for short. Fine. Uh, this uh, gentleman is one of the truly outstanding speakers in the agricultural field, and in fact, think in your work as uh, national vice president, I presume you do a great deal of speaking all over the country. Yes, I speak, what you might say, almost continuously to all kinds of groups, to farm groups, to conventions of other types, and uh, any place that I can, uh, let's say, do some good for the American farmer, I'm there and try to explain what the problem is and what needs to be done about it. Well, I think that your background certainly qualifies you, as do the backgrounds of most of the executives of NFO. Almost all NFO executives have farm background, and that certainly is the case with you. And in fact, I understand that uh, you have one of the really outstanding farms in the state of Iowa. Where is it, I think, and how big is it? It's at a little town by the name of Sergeant Bluff, Iowa, which is about six miles south of Sioux City, Iowa. It's on the level land down there. And the Missouri River Valley. Yes, I think I have one of the finest pieces of land there is in the state of mm -hmm. Iowa. And uh, when I started getting very active, let's say, in promoting the welfare of American agriculture, I was farming at that time between 15 and 1,700 acres of land. I raised about 500 head of hogs and have fed some cattle. However, because of the intensity of the activity that is needed in order to saved the family farm. I have cut my operation to about 550 acres at the present time, mm -hmm. and uh, I still raise the 500 head of hogs. I do not uh, produce cattle anymore, and of mm -hmm. course, needless to say, I have one of the finest uh, men working for me that any farmer could have anywhere, and that, of course, turns me loose for a lot of activity. Fink and I established uh, quite some time ago the fact that uh, we both went to college in Kansas, Right. In fact, uh, your school was St. John's at Winfield. I went to the College of Emporia as well as the Emporia State Teachers College, but College of Emporia and St. John's, uh, we determined, uh, played athletics in the same conference, right? Yeah, we used to take an awful beating every time, <laughs> but we still kept it up. You do a lot of traveling, don't you? I travel nationwide. Yeah. Now, in your travels and in your talking to people, in spreading the NFO word, I presume that much of what you say is predicated on the fact that a farm problem does exist. Oh, yes, it's a very, very severe problem and getting worse, you might say, almost daily, To I think, where we're at a point of where we're destroying all of rural America as well as the family farm, and I think eventually destroy the economy of this nation if this problem is not immediately solved. And uh, this, of course, is the driving force of what mm -hmm. makes us go why we have to put the NFO program into operation. Well, then, I was going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and predict the future of agriculture, but you just now did, I think, with your statement. It's a rather bleak outlook, I Yes, think, yes. If something isn't done and if these problems are not uh, solved. What are the answers to these problems? Well, there's only one problem or, or one answer. First of all, you have to understand the problem, the reason that we have the low farm prices that we do. And, and the price is the only problem that there is out there in rural America. And the reason we don't have prices is because the rest of the economy, specifically the buying interests that buy from the American farmer, and I'm talking about the f people who finally get the production, they have modernized. They've modernized to the hilt, as really every segment should. They've, uh, let's say, organized, consolidated, and merged to where today, for all practical purposes, our buyers are national in scope, where they can bypass any area, any market, any individual, and actually pit one against the other. While the farmer is still going to the market in the same method that he did a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. our great grandfathers, and, say, and ask his buyer what it pleases them to pay him. So the only thing that can ever solve this farm problem is to get the farmers into position to be businessmen in the market instead of being panhandlers or beggars as they are now. So they have to get into a position where they can establish their own price, a price based on their cost of production rather than a price based on the whims of our buyers mm -hmm. or on their convenience. Mm -hmm. Now, 
another term for it is block bargaining. Right? Block bargaining, collective bargaining. Yes. It's the only method in which the farmer can ever reach the point to where he can uh, affect uh, the buyers as they are affecting us now. See, it's a national setup. Our buyers are national, as I said, in scope. Well, in order to counteract that, the farmer is also going to mm -hmm. have to become effective nationally, and you can't do it as an individual here sitting on a local farm. It has to be done by farmers getting together into one organization, bargaining together and selling together as one man, so that they can meet this force that they have. The law of supply and demand can't work with all of the power on one side and absolutely none on the other, and this is exactly what we have. So once the farmers get together, block their production together, market together, bargain together, I think at that point they'll be able to reach that, uh, the, reach a fair price. Well, those are the, yes, those are the necessary steps in well, bargaining. absolutely necessary. Think in grain bargaining, what is the first step? Well, the first step necessary to be uh, effective in grain bargaining is that the farmers must keep control of their grain at harvest time so that the buyers cannot get a supply on hand that'll let them sit back and then wait for the farmers to dribble in mm -hmm. the rest of their production so that they don't have to bid. And partially to understand this, you have to understand that in uh, well, words, virtually all production, farm production, we have a very static situation where the same uh, farmer sells to the same elevator who sells to the same broker who sells to the same a grain company who sells to the same processor and so forth. So this has to be broken up if you're going to make the grain market competitive and only one way to do it and that's to keep enough at harvest time so that they have to bid to get it and then of course by changing patterns by taking it out of one area into the other creating a vacuum that you make them bid mm -hmm. for grain and this brings the general price up. Well, Fink, do you uh, carry on this kind of practice in your own farming operation in Iowa? I sure do. I wouldn't think of selling one bushel of grain at harvest time, and I've got myself set up, of course, so that I can hold all of mine. I'd say that I probably have close to 80,000 bushel in storage right now on my farm. Mrs. Finkston has become somewhat accustomed to Fink's long speaking tours. She's made her yard a real show place, and on the farm, Fink and his foreman managed to stay busy storing and drying corn. Last year's crop was a good one, and Fink periodically inspects his storage facilities for leaks or moisture. New storage facilities have been readied, and this year's crops are already in the process of being dried. Now, in grain bargaining, what is the first step? They must keep it within their power so that they can bargain for and Then you bring enough of a block together you can do several things. You see, you can create the vacuum that I'm talking about by upsetting the static condition in marketing that you have. If uh, an area, and pretty much over the United States, and especially in the main grain producing areas, uh, it is divided off by areas among the big companies. They don't have to bid because they have probably the only, get uh, all of the production out of any given area. And as long as there's nothing, nothing upset there, there's no reason to bid. But if you pull a million, several million bushel out of that area, they are going to be short and they're going to have to bid for it. They're going to have to get it from sources that they haven't been getting it from before. And there's only one way they can induce farmers to, get, to do it, to sell to them, to change their pattern, and that is by offering them more money. So you've placed competition back in the area by upsetting us the static pattern that they had before. This works in all production. We've uh, talked uh, earlier about some of the problems that uh, agriculture is suffering today. What do you feel are the real critical farm issues, Think. Well, of course, price is it, and then, of course, the issue then becomes of how do you get that price. Uh, uh, government programs enter into this to a great extent, and in the past, farmers have relied very much on the government to uh, support their prices, to hold up the prices, which then finally amounts to that the support price is the least the law will let them pay. Mm -hmm. And this has pretty much determined our price in the past. Our prices have always, until the NFO got into the picture, have followed this support price. That's been about it. Well, I think we have a real critical uh, time ahead of us right now because the programs are under fire. The farm program that we have now is to expire at the end of 1970. And so in the meantime, either we have to get a new one or we go back to what it would be real chaos. And I think the most critical thing that we have to guard against right now is the proposals that have been made by the Farm Bureau. 
And uh, I, t I think that that proposal is probably the most devastating blow that the American farmer ever got if this program goes into effect. Their program provides, first of all, on the support prices, that it be 85% of the previous three years average. 85% support. Now, uh, remembering that the support prices to a great extent set the price, this would mean that the first year that that program was be in effect, we would have a 15% drop in support prices. Mm -hmm. It would mean that each year after that, we took an additional cut of 5%. And this would figure out that in a, a, the five-year period that their program has been proposed for, that we would drop to in the 60 cents a bushel for corn, to give you just one example. And of course, I'd say we're very close to the cost of production figure at the present time, so we can't afford to take a 15% cut now or an additional 5% each year after that. In addition to that, they propose cutting out the government payments. Well, the government payments at the present time constitute 7% of the gross income of the American farmer and 24% of the net income. So that one section of their program in itself would, comp would take away 24% of the program. Then they have a land retirement program, a whole farm retirement program, supposedly voluntary. Well, in the first place, the, their program calls for taking a million acres a year, or 10 million, pardon me, 10 million acres a year out of production. Well, at the present time, this year, 1969, there are 57 million acres out of production. So if we dropped that, the allotments and so forth, and then went, back, went to that program, that would mean that the very first year, as compared to this year, we would have 47 million acres more in production. Well, this again would cause a glut and would make the farm, put the farmer in still more hopeless situation. Now, the emphasis is, is on that this is voluntary. First of all, I can't see why the real cry is there for the voluntary part of it, because all of our programs are voluntary. Any man that doesn't want to participate, he doesn't have to. So he's free to do as he pleases now and still in a position to take advantage of the, adva uh, of the increased prices that the programs do offer. But this will be gone. Now, the man who is not participating in a farm program, he's going to lose very severely by this because he cannot increase his acreage or his output, and he's going to get lower prices. So there's only one way for him, and that is to go downward. Now, in addition to that, the voluntary part is not voluntary for many of the people who are going to be affected. Presumably, the older people, the people who want to leave farming anyway, are going to put that land into that million acres a year that's being taken out. So it may be voluntary for him, but it is not voluntary for that young tenant who is now farming the land, who can't buy his own farm. It is not voluntary for that farmer who uh, who uh, rents some adjoining land that makes up part of his program now or part of his operation. So if he were to lose, let's say, half of the land that he's farming now, he's set up with a line of equipment that cannot be supported on that reduced acreage. So I'd say it is, uh, it's a very severe blow. And I think we had better watch this because the average age of farmers now is 57 years old. We have to have these young people coming into the farming if we're going to continue to produce this food. In addition to it, we're losing the know-how out there in agriculture. The income now is only 3% on the investment. And how can a young farmer start by borrowing money from 6 to 10% yes. and receive only 3% yes. mm -hmm. return and at the same time donate his work? So I'd say agriculture is facing a very severe test at this time, and uh, I'd say we'll face destruction if the Farm Bureau program goes into effect. Fingston's comments concerning low profit margins for farmers brought to mind a recent interview with a young NFO farmer. Kent Remington, with his brother, operates a 2,000-acre farm near St. Anthony, Idaho. Kent is a representative of the National Farmers Organization, not salaried or paid by them, but he represents this fine organization as potato marketing coordinator for the Northwestern states. Kent, it's a pleasure to welcome you to U.S. Farm Report. Thank you, Bill. It's good to be here. Kent, what kind of an investment do you and your brother have in this operation in Idaho? Bill, Jerry and I have around a million dollars invest invested in land, machinery, buildings, and our packing shed. Well, now, what kind of a return the last few years have you realized on that million-dollar investment? In the last three years, we have 
had less than 1%, about 1% net. That's uh, fairly ridiculous, isn't it? We feel so. <laughs> Can you think of any other business in the whole world investing a million dollars and getting that kind of a return that wouldn't be hollering about it? No, Bill, and that's what concerns us so much because uh, we aren't alone in this. Uh, millions of farmers clear across the United States are in this same predicament. And the uh, people don't understand, the, uh, the people in the cities don't understand our problems here. And some of them see these little farmers out in a, in a little old house that their grandfathers was born and raised in. And they say, well, farmers are different. They're, <laughs> they're yeah. a second class citizen. Yes. And that's the way they expect to live and enjoy living. But really, we don't. St. Anthony, Idaho is a town of what size, Kent? St. Anthony is about 5,500 people, right up against the, laying right in the valley of the Rocky Mountains uh -huh. in the upper Snake River Valley. Well, that's pretty country. Yes, we think so. Now, in this 2,000 acres that you and your brother operate, uh, how many acres are devoted to potato growing? This year we have about 650 acres. Uh -huh. It varies from year to year according to our rotation. And what other kind of farming do you do there? We raise feed grain and uh, wheat and uh, a little hay, very little hay. We have a cattle feeding operation. Mm -hmm. How many cattle do you run there, Ken? Well, that too varies from, uh, oh, up to 250 head down. We carry around 100 head in the summertime. Mm -hmm. But in the wintertime, when we have cull potatoes and off-grade potatoes to feed to our cattle, or we feed them to our cattle, mm -hmm. and when we have them, well, we boost our herds up according to how many potatoes that we have. Your family, as I understand it, has lived uh, in the St. Anthony area for a long, long time. Yes, my father and mother was uh, practically raised there. Her father was born there. My wife and her family was, mm -hmm. was all born and raised within a 10-mile radius of St. Anthony. You graduated from St. Anthony High School and went on to a business college in Salt Lake for a couple of years. Are you applying what you learned in business college to your farming operation? Well. That's hard to tell. I'm glad my wife went to business college, too. <laughs> well, I think that, that gives us the answer. She handles that part of it for you, huh? Yes. You, uh, you have children, do you not? Yes, we have two daughters, one 15, one 13. Well, now, the potato industry admits, does it not, that uh, there has been a price rise of around a dollar per hundred weight. Yes, uh, Bill, last year we in Idaho wanted to do something in potatoes uh, for NFO. To, you know, you always want to flex your muscles and test your strength, and sure. you never know what you can do till you try something. And so we tried to do a little bargaining in potatoes. And, and we went out and was successful in getting a contract from a fresh packer, and, and that contract was for a little bit more than the market price. And uh, when we got that contract, we put the word out to the farmers, and the farmers, uh, whether they would member or non-member, why they wasn't going to take less than that price. Mm -hmm. So the opposition has a way of fighting, which is quite effective. But to make that price look bad, they would raise it, go out and buy a small lot of potatoes and raise it a dime or 15 cents above that price and make that, make that price look bad to the farmers. Mm -hmm. But so what we did is when they raised it a dime or 15 cents, we raised it a dime or 15 cents, and we just kept uh, raising that market up. And when the industry was saying that we were short of potatoes is the reason the market was raising, what they didn't realize that up in Red River Valley, those people were still selling their potatoes for a dollar a hundred because NFO wasn't working up mm -hmm. there. And, and our price got up so high that, that our processors even went up in Red River Valley, bought the potatoes for a, a dollar a hundred and could ship them down to Idaho to process them cheaper than they could buy them right in Idaho. So it wasn't that there was a shortage of potatoes because it wasn't. Uh, in the industry, we kept telling them that we was affecting this market. And they said, well, a good test is in February. Historically, the market always slumps in February. And what happened? Uh, they said if we would hold that market in February, they would admit that we was the major factor in pricing potatoes. And we didn't only hold it, but we pushed it up during <laughs> February. Yeah. 
and the market never did fall until our farmers, bargainers, and this is the, the thing, our people that was bargaining wasn't professional bargainers out of a college or out of the East or anything, they was farmers right off the farm. Mm -hmm. And eventually they had to go back on the farm and plow their crops and, and plow their the ground and get ready to plant their crops. And the market the day that our boys went back on the farm fell and it went right on down for the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. Again, well, the, excuse me, I'm go ahead. sorry. No, go ahead. I just, it was interesting. One of the fresh packers, we, towards the end of the season, we went in and wanted to sell him a lot of spuds, and he said, I'll buy 100,000 sacks right now if you will stay in bargaining. And Lyle says, well, I can't. He says, I've got to go to my farm. You've got to get to work. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, then I'm not interested, because if you guys quit bargaining, I know this market will drop. Yeah. What about the new crop? Uh, Sign-ins are, uh, are really going good, aren't they? We feel real good, uh, Bill. Last year, uh, we asked the farmers to sign in a portion of their crop they wanted NFO to bargain for. And it worked fine, but, you know, we got to selling contracts so fast that sometimes it was almost buying our total amount of supplies and we would have to sign more in before we could go write another contract. This year, uh, the farmers, instead of signing five or 10,000 sacks or 15,000 sacks, are signing their entire production in right now for NFO to bargain with under these no penalty sales agreements. Is it this way over most of the state of Idaho? Throughout the state of Idaho, it is. Yes. And uh, in Colorado, or in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in Oregon, those farmers are doing a wonderful job mm -hmm. of signing them in, too. What uh, made you interested in NFO to begin with? You're a member now of, what, a little less than two years standing? Yeah. What uh, attracted you to NFO, Kent? Well, Bill, I think that the milk holding action back in, in 57 was the thing that brought me to NFO. At the time that these farmers were dumping milk and the cameras were showing this milk flowing down the bar pits and and uh, they was the farmers and their wives in their overalls out there dumping their milk on their ground. I, I thought at the time it was foolish, but I couldn't get this out of my mind that there was a group of people that wasn't saying, why don't somebody do something for me? They was out there trying to do something for themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to do something that will affect the, their market themselves, and they're not asking that age-old question, why don't somebody do something for me? And that's all I've ever wanted to do, is to have the opportunity to do something for myself. And I don't believe that the government should support us. I'm a taxpayer, and, and I should support the government. And I don't think that the government should have to dig into their tax money and pay me diversion prices and pay me not to produce and such as that. I only want an opportunity to be able to do it myself. And here was a national organization that had that one thought in mind, is to get the farmer a net and be able to do it himself. And, and that's what brought me, er, drew me to the NFO. Uh, in a national organization, we're trying to tear down state lines, just as in the states we're trying to tear down county lines. And, and to be able to do this, it seems like every state feels like they have their own individual problems and they should work them out themselves. And so if a state comes up with a problem in the potato business alone, then they, if the state can't correct it, why well, they'll ask me to go and, and work with them. Now, I don't claim to be the brilliant man and can, can figure all these problems out, but I go there, we call a meeting of the people who have the problem, we talk about it, get all the problems down we can, then if, if we can't come up with the an answer among us, then we can call on national. And, and we call in into the National Farmers Organization and they have all of the brains clear across the nation. And somewhere the answer to those problems are, and, and so ma mainly that's what I do, and I promote NFO at every opportunity that I can. 
but mainly I, I keep the Northwestern states coordinated with the national organization in the potato. The Farm Bureau is, in my opinion, not at all a farm organization. It's an insurance company. It's one of the biggest businesses there is in the United States. And Mr. Schumann, when he goes into Washington to testify, he says he represents so many families. He did quit saying farm families because I clipped him on that a few <laughs> years ago and I pointed out that he claimed 200 um, uh, 200,000 farm families in the state of Illinois, yet the state of Illinois said they had only 120,000 farmers. So he does not represent the farmers, and I'm out there in the country every day among farm people, and night after night and day after day, these members of Farm Bureau tell me that they do not approve of their policies, that they're in there as members only because they feel that they get cheaper insurance, which I also don't believe. I think our mm -hmm. state laws see to it that uh, when you're selling for less, that you're also giving less, or when you're charging more, that you have to deliver. So I'd say they're insurance customers. He doesn't represent that many farmers. He represents that many sh insurance policies. And so I'd say that any time that a man takes an insurance policy or does business with them in some of their other operations and he becomes a member of that, Mr. Schumann says in Washington that that man is for what he is proposing, and I don't think that's right at all. No, he doesn't represent. Never did. For years, they haven't represented farmers. I can see that one of your problems, Fink, is that you just aren't enthusiastic enough about NFOs. Well, give me a little time. Maybe <laughs> I can get worked up about it. It's been a real pleasure. This has been most interesting, and thank you so much for being our guest today. Thanks for having me here. My pleasure. Today, ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Erhard Fingston, National Vice President of the National Farmers Organization. <laughs>